Ron noticed Ian's gaze and looked up to meet it. I'm sorry for what Liana did. She... He began saying, and Ian raised his eyebrows quietly, finally calming down a little. Ron took a deep breath and continued. She didn't do it on purpose. I'll tell her to apologize to Madison and Sophia. I'm sorry, he added. Ian gave a small smile and turned back to Sophia. So Ron knows that Liana has feelings for me, he thought. He could tell from the look in Ron's eyes. Perhaps Ron hadn't known at first, as Liana had been using him to cover it up. However, now that he had spent enough time with her, he would have had to be blind not to figure it out. Even though Ian hadn't seen exactly what had happened at the Griffin with his own eyes, he no longer trusted Liana in the slightest. She had always regarded Madison as her enemy, and it seemed that she would stop at nothing to vent her anger toward her. But Ron, he thought, pursing his lips. He finished wrapping the bandage around Sophia's wounds and hugged her close. Ron bit his lip. He felt strange, but he wasn't sure if it was because he felt guilty or because he wasn't used to apologizing to people. I believe that she didn't do it on purpose. You know that too, she's always been such a kind person. Would she be capable of doing something like this? He said, but he felt like he was convincing himself more than Ian. You know how she's always taking care of everyone, even the animals on the street. She doesn't have a mean bone in her body, he mumbled trying to analyze the situation according to what he knew about his colleague and partner. And she's been so good to everyone at the hospital, too. She's been helping you keep your office tidy for five years, and she even comes to help me with mine every so often. We've known her for so long. Shouldn't five years be enough to know a person? I believe she didn't... I believe her, Ron explained. His voice gradually faded off into nothing. Sophia pouted up at Ian and whispered, I want to see Mommy. She tried to get off his lap, and he set her down on the floor. She ran out of the room at once, leaving the two men behind alone. Ian put his hands into his pockets and walked over to the window, while Ron remained seated, still shaking his head and thinking about Liana. Ian's not a fool. Even if he didn't see it happen, he wouldn't have acted like that if he hadn't known something I don't, Ron thought. Finally, he stood up and looked at Ian. He tried to speak, but he couldn't seem to form the words he wanted to say. Ian looked out at the autumn landscape quietly before saying, This was the last time, Ron. If she does anything like this again, she won't be able to escape me, even if you try to protect her. He turned and walked out through the door, leaving Ron standing in the middle of the room speechless. He knows something. He just let it slide this time because of me, he thought. He felt rage bubbling up inside him for the first time in ages, and he punched the wall to vent his anger and frustration. Liana. Liana, my Liana, he repeated in his mind. Dr. Garcia had cut off Madison's sleeve to make the bandaging more comfortable. Her arm now stuck out at a strange angle awkwardly bulky and straight. When Ian came in, she was lying on the bed, talking to their daughter in a soft voice. Sophia lay with her head on Madison's chest and a happy smile on her face. Ian looked at his beautiful wife under the autumn sun and felt that she looked miserable in her bandaged up state, yet so sweet as she cuddled Sophia. Her whole body seemed to be admitting a motherly aura. Does it still hurt, Mommy? Sophia asked. I can help you sleep, okay? She wriggled about and cuddled up close to Madison careful not to hurt her. She looked up at her mother with eyes full of worry. Do you want me to go and find Daddy? I think he'll be here soon, the little girl continued. Madison gave her a small smile and ran her hand over her hair. As she did so, she glimpsed Ian standing in the doorway. She didn't know how long he had been there, but the look in her eyes became even gentler and her smile deepened when she saw him. She felt extremely lucky at that moment. She wondered if perhaps her accident would make him forget about their divorce papers. How long have you been there? She asked him, trying to sit up. Don't move, he told her. I asked Mr. Williams to get you hospitalized for a few days. I want you to have good rest while you're here. What? No! Madison protested anxiously. 
I don't want to stay here. I want to go home. I don't want to be here. They looked at each other for a while, not saying anything. Sophia didn't understand what was going on between them, and she pursed her lips as she looked between her parents. Madison desperately wanted to go home. If he left her at the hospital alone, she knew that she wouldn't get to see him. He wouldn't be able to return to the operating room before he got his condition under control. He would just keep applying for sick leave until he got better so he wouldn't reveal the real reason behind his recent absence. She reached her hand out to him, and when he came to stand by her side, she wrapped her fingers around his palm. I don't want to stay here. I don't like being here overnight. Besides, I'm finally getting the chance to spend more time with Sophia. Please don't take that away from me. Besides, it'll be easier for me to recuperate at home. I don't want to... All right, let's go home, he said, sighing. She smiled at him brightly, and Sophia let out a happy laugh as she hugged Madison. The door opened, and Damien rushed in. He hurried over to see Sophia as soon as he heard that she was in the hospital. His face was full of concern, and he pulled her into his arms when he saw her, relieved. Madison laughed at the sweetness of the moment, and the boy put Sophia back down again, his cheeks red. He took her out of the room, leaving Madison and Ian alone. They trusted the young boy to take good care of their daughter. She took Ian's hand again and relaxed when she felt the familiar sensation of his touch. Let's go home then, she told him softly. He gazed at her lovingly, and something resounded in his heart, deep and moving. He helped her up and let her lean against him as he took her out of the room. She held on to him tightly with her uninjured arm, smiling into his chest. As they walked through the hallways, some of the nurses and doctors commented on the romantic display, whispering among each other. Some of them even teased them lightly. He responded to all of them with a smile while she rested her face against him tired. In the parking lot, he helped her into the car and buckled her seatbelt. His eyes fell on her bandages once again, and he felt a chill run down his spine. I'm fine, Madison assured him, seeing that he was worried. She pulled at the collar of his shirt. As long as you're with me, I can withstand anything. It's just a little inconvenience. It'll heal in no time, won't it? She looked at him expectantly, using the explanation to simultaneously express how she felt about their relationship. She wanted him to stay with her and never leave. Ian didn't answer her. Instead, he leaned over and planted a kiss on her lips. It was short and sweet, but it lingered long after he had drawn away. They both hoped that their relationship would continue like that forever. Ian stopped the car a little way from the Weston home, and Madison gave him a questioning look. He got out and went to open the door for her, and he crouched down and extended his arms. Come on, I'll carry you home, Ian told her. He wanted to carry her like a fairy tale princess. Things were tough between them, and he sometimes lost control of himself and ended up hurting her. But he wanted to carry her home as if everything was all right. He loved her with all his heart and couldn't keep that affection from showing in his eyes. Although Ian wanted her to be happy and free, he couldn't stand the thought of her leaving him. He didn't even dare think about what it would do to him, especially as he knew that he would be the one to blame if she ended up leaving. They had been together for such a long time and shared a great intimacy, but he hadn't carried her like that in a long time. With watery eyes, she nodded and let him pick her up, wrapping her arm around him and resting her head against his shoulder. He felt her soft breath on his face. Ian seemed even more handsome to her, and she noticed how much more mature he looked compared to when they had met. Despite all the hardships that they had been through, they were still together, and they were both stronger than ever. I can't remember the last time you carried me like this, she told him. Me neither, he replied with a smile. I think it's time we started with it again, though. They smiled at each other. Promise me that you'll carry me around like this for as long as you can, okay? Never make me scared or sad again, and don't do anything to chase me away, she said. The divorce papers in her bag didn't carry her signature yet, but they still felt extremely heavy. 
When she thought of Ian's name already written on them, she felt uncomfortable all over. It was like there was a bomb ticking somewhere near, getting ready to explode. What scared her even more than those papers were the deeply rooted thoughts within his mind. She was scared that he would force her to sign the agreement against her will. He didn't give her the affirmation she was longing for. Instead, he stopped in his tracks and stood on the spot by the road. The wind blew around them, whistling in their ears, and the warm setting sun seemed like a distasteful contrast to the heaviness of the moment. Only the falling brown leaves seemed to understand their struggle. She held her breath as she waited for him to say something, her heart beating at a frightening pace as she became more and more nervous. Why did I have to say that? She scolded herself. He cleared his throat and looked down at her. I'll try my best to do those things for you, but I can't promise you that I'll never have to do something you won't like, he told her. She bit her lip and frowned at him. She didn't want to say anything to offend him, knowing that he was in a sensitive state. She didn't want him to make her sign those papers. The divorce agreement is for you, so that you can protect yourself if you need to. He remembered how he had seen her crying at the restaurant, and how deeply it had cut him. You don't have to sign them now, but there may come a time when you'll have to. I... everything could... His words faded, and he fell silent once again before setting back into motion. She gave him a serious look as her chest heaved up and down, and she found herself in a terrible mood. Nonetheless, she gritted her teeth and set herself to resolve. She wasn't going to give up. Even if he did, she wouldn't. No one had ever fought for what she had wanted except for Ian. But now that he had also been sucked into a whirlpool of despair, she only wanted one thing from him. To stay by her side and never leave her. And if he did want to leave, then they would leave together. The sky got darker and darker as they neared the house, and finally the sun had completely set. The streetlights lit up along the road as he walked on with her, pressed against his back. When Damien arrived with Sophia at the Weston's place, Olivia and Edward began to worry. Daniel called Mr. Williams to ask him what had happened, and was relieved when he found out that Ian and Madison were on their way. The family sat in the living room, quietly waiting for them to return. The TV was on, and a reporter was speaking about Jason. The heir of the Wright family, Jason Wright, was seriously injured several days ago. He received immediate attention the moment he came out of the ICU. We are waiting for new information on his medical state, but he should be in good hands given all the medical connections to the Wright family. The reporter on the screen said into the camera. Olivia watched the TV transfixed. Edward also kept his eyes trained on the screen, but nobody could tell what he was thinking. If it wasn't for Madison, Ian wouldn't be suffering so much right now, she muttered, and a heavy silence ensued. Ever since they got married, there's been nothing but fighting and drama. Now she had to go and get involved with Jason. The rights will never treat Ian, and it's all because of her. I hate that girl. Cassandra continued to fiddle with the potted plant before her as she said, You don't hate her, Mom. If you did... Then how could you have tolerated her in the family for over six years now? You're just complicating things because you're upset about Ian. Olivia didn't respond to her daughter's words. I do hate her. I don't care what anyone thinks, she thought, huffing. She was sure that her animosity toward Madison was clear to see. The butler joined them in the room to announce Ian and Madison's arrival. When Ian stepped through the door carrying Madison on his back, Olivia scowled. When he placed his wife on the couch, Olivia grabbed his arm and pulled him away from her. She gave Madison a stern look. Madison, how old are you? She asked her daughter-in-law. Did you need to go to the hospital because of some stupid food burn? Just because you're Ian's wife doesn't mean you're some precious little lady who needs pampering. What about poor Sophia's hand? Why didn't you protect your child? And why are you forcing your husband to carry you up here? when you could have easily gone by car. Minnie had to go find the car on foot so she could drive it back, and all just so you could feel special, she shouted. Madison had begun panicking ever since they had walked through the front door. Now 
she could only look at Olivia with sealed lips. After a while, she dared to glance up at Ian and saw that he was casually standing there, drinking a glass of water. Her heart leaped at his cold, indifferent attitude, but she swallowed her sorrow and put on a stoic face. I'm sorry, Olivia, she said in a level voice. It was my fault that I got hurt today. Please don't get angry. I promise I'll be more careful next time. Both Daniel and Cassandra frowned at Ian, but the man remained as he was, seemingly unbothered. Seriously, what good is an advertising design degree when you can't even take care of yourself? How are you supposed to take care of your family, huh? Why can't you learn how to do something useful? If you don't, Ian's only going to end up suffering because of you. Madison felt herself become weaker with every word Olivia said to her. There was nothing that she could do other than nod humbly and accept the criticism. In the tense atmosphere, Cassandra looked at Madison, who was nodding obediently, and then at Ian, who was standing to the side acting as if nothing had happened. His lips curled into a bitter smile. She went up to Olivia and pulled her away from Madison, unable to listen to her words anymore. A heavy feeling had settled in her chest. It seemed that none of them could have a good life. Daniel seemed to have gotten the best deal of all the Weston children. She's like a child. Don't tell me she's counting on Ian to take care of her forever. Olivia continued, muttering as Cassandra led her away, her tone full of blame and dissatisfaction. Madison remained on the couch, unmoving. All she did was raise her eyes to look at Ian. She could see the tension in his stance, but he still acted like nothing was going on. Even when he was like this, she still refused to leave him. That evening, Ian sat alone on the couch in their bedroom, watching the dark scenery outside. He was breathing heavily, and his hands were clenched into fists as he tried to get his emotions in check yet again. He felt like he was about to explode, but he had to be careful so that Madison wouldn't find out. His heart ached for her. When she begged him not to leave, tears running down her face, he had felt so sorry for her. Then... When he had been forced to watch his mother criticize her for something that hadn't been her fault, he had wanted to step in and stand up for her so badly. To hug her close and hold her in his arms until she was okay. But he hadn't, because he needed to learn to push her away. He took another deep breath and felt like he was going crazy. He could do all those things he wanted for her. He could protect her and hold her and love her but he also knew that he would end up pushing her away and hurting her again. He looked over at the bed where she lay fast asleep, mesmerized by her peaceful form. He got up and walked over to her, looking down at her lovingly. She was wrapped in bandages all over, yet even in her vulnerable state, he had let his mother yell at her without saying a word in her defense. He sat down on the edge of the bed and studied her face until it was imprinted in his mind. Reaching out toward her, his fingers brushed over her delicate, charming face and drew his hand over her eyebrows, down to her lips, and down to her beating heart. She smiled a little, but remained deeply asleep. The light in the hallway turned on, and Cassandra walked in with a tray of food. She sighed a little when she saw him, and walked over to set the food down on the bedside table. Mom said that a lot of doctors have contacted you, they're going to come in tomorrow to take a look at you. If they don't come up with anything, we might have to take you to the hospital. We'll figure this out, but we need you to cooperate. She spoke softly, afraid of waking Madison. He only looked down at his wife, deep in thought. Cassandra's eyes switched to her too, and she sighed again. Please, just cooperate, for Madison's sake. Don't you understand how much she loves you? What kind of heart she has? With that, she turned around and left the bedroom. He was still looking down at his sleeping wife. How much she loves me, he thought. He didn't understand why Madison loved him so much. I just want her to be happy and safe. Late at night, Madison woke up and found him sleeping next to her. She didn't move as she didn't want to risk waking him. 
His palm was still placed on her chest, and he hadn't even changed his clothes before going to sleep. She let him hug her and smiled, tears welling up in her eyes again. She needed to know why he was being so cold toward her. He had tried to chase her away so many times. He had even filed for divorce again, and had let his mother give her a hard time. Still, every time she looked at him, she could see the pity in his eyes. The duality of his actions was hard to understand. Although she knew him and loved him greatly, she wasn't willing to accept this. She believed in herself and him, and was determined to fight for what they had with all her might. She moved gently in his arms, snuggling up to him even more closely. His body beside hers was warmly familiar, especially when he held her in his arms like that. She laughed a little as he pulled her closer, but she also felt like crying. How can you want me to give up on you? She thought. Madison woke up early the next day thinking about all the things still ahead of her. Coupled with Olivia's demands, she was overflowing with work. She had called up Allie the previous night to let her know that she would be taking some time off, and all her work at the studio was suspended indefinitely while she recuperated at the Weston house. As soon as she opened her eyes, she noticed that Ian was no longer beside her. She sat up anxiously, looking around for her husband. Pain shot through her arm and leg at the abrupt movement, and her face contorted in agony. But she pushed through the pain and forced herself to lift the blanket off and get out of bed. Where is he? She thought, concerned. Precisely at that moment, Ian came into the room with breakfast. When he saw her trying to get up, he frowned at her. So she sat back down at once and looked up at him with wide eyes. Walking over to her, he sat the tray down on the bedside table. But his heart began to thump as he noticed the panicked look in her eyes. He realized that she must have thought he had left her there and had been about to search for him. She was afraid he didn't want her anymore. You should eat something. I'll redress the wound after, he told her softly as he sat down on the edge of the bed. Picking up a bowl of oatmeal, he blew on it to cool it down a little. She leaned against the headboard gingerly, noticing that the pain wasn't as bad when she had only made small movements. Happy that he was there with her, she gave him a little smile. Since she had burned her right arm, and her left arm wasn't quite as dexterous, he helped her eat the meal by spoon-feeding it to her. Once she had finished, he helped her up to take her to the bathroom. There was a knock on the door, and Olivia's voice sounded from outside. Dr. Height is here. Would you like to go down to meet him? Go on, Madison told him anxiously scared that Olivia would barge in and accuse her of using Ian again. I can wash. Without even looking at her, he called out, Ask him to wait a moment. I'll be down soon. He then continued guiding her over to the bathroom to help her bathe. Ian seemed unbothered by the outside world, focusing only on helping his wife. It was like he didn't care that the whole family had been thrown into chaos because of him. Once she was clean... He took her back to the bed and sat her down. When he started redressing her wounds, she batted his hands away. Please, just go down. You can't keep them waiting like this. It's not good, Madison requested. He stood up, but instead of going to the door, he fetched his medical kit and sat back down beside her. He wasn't listening to her at all, which made her even more anxious. Ian, she said again, go down and see the doctor. I don't need you to do this now. Besides, Dr. Garcia applied for the medicine yesterday. It doesn't need changing yet. You should go. He cut her off with just a glance. But the way he took care of her bandages was unmistakably loving and tender. He was a strange man, both cold and gentle at the same time. She pouted but didn't press the matter anymore, allowing him to do what he deemed necessary. Olivia turned up more than once to remind him of the doctor waiting for him, and each time he told her to wait a little longer. Madison was scared that he would go back on his word and refuse to see a doctor completely. Finally, Olivia snapped. What exactly are you trying to do, Ian? Dr. Hyde has been waiting for you for over half an hour now, she demanded from behind the door. She gripped the handle and prepared to barge in. 
Don't you understand how serious this is? Even if you... Now inside the bedroom, she stopped dead in her tracks when she saw what was keeping Ian so long. While they were all anxiously waiting for him to come down, he was carefully redressing his wretched wife's wounds. Her eyes bulged so hard, they almost fell out of her sockets. In an instant, the anger in her heart increased tenfold. Olivia glared at her daughter-in-law, her eyes burning with rage. Madison, she barked out, instantly blaming her instead of her child for the holdup. No matter what Ian did, she would always get angry at Madison, never him. Shocked by Olivia's sudden scolding, Madison jerked away, and her ankle twisted painfully in Ian's grip. Tears sprang to her eyes, but she didn't dare make a sound in front of Olivia. She gulped heavily and bit down on her lip to keep herself from crying out before she dared look up and meet her mother-in-law's eyes. Ian looked down at her swollen ankle with concern. He wanted to reprimand her for moving, but then he noticed how much pain she was in and thought better of it. Her lips were already white from the pressure she was putting on them, and her face was covered in a cold sweat. She grabbed the bedsheets with her uninjured hand and scrunched them up in her fist, not letting her pain show on her face as she looked at Olivia. Madison sat there trembling, feeling wronged and helpless. Most of them had already rejected her. In some ways, divorce would have been a good decision. Perhaps they were just torturing each other by refusing to let go. Ian, please go down and see Dr. Hyde. I told you I'm fine, she insisted after calming herself down a little. She sounded fragile and timid. He didn't even think about it. Instead, he gently placed her foot onto his knee and took out the medicine. He began carefully applying it over the sore area, completely ignoring both his mother and his wife. The more Ian stubbornly insisted on pampering Madison, the more Olivia hated her existence. She was also becoming increasingly frustrated with how lightly Ian was taking his medical condition and their attempts to find him a suitable doctor. However, it was still easier for her to pin it all on Madison's influence than acknowledge that it was her son's doing. Don't you have any conscience at all? She spat out at Madison. Now is not the time for him to be changing your bandages. Is this why he's been taking so long to go and see Dr. Hyde? He's throwing away the rare opportunity to see a prestigious doctor just because of this? He's lucky to even get the chance to meet with Dr. Hyde. If you truly loved Ian even a little bit with that rotten heart of yours, you wouldn't ask him to do this right now. Anybody else could have helped you. Why did you need it to be Ian? What are you trying to do? Olivia said. Madison didn't make a sound during Olivia's angry monologue. She just lowered her head and looked at Ian's hand through teary eyes. However, it seemed that Olivia hadn't finished yet. She took a few deep breaths before continuing. Ian needs to get rid of you right now. You've brought nothing but suffering into this house. You don't care about your husband at all. You should have gotten divorced ages ago. I know we were against it before, but I won't blame you if you go through with it this time. I won't say a word. I'll be very grateful to you. I'll even pay you to do it. Both Madison and Ian stiffened when she mentioned the divorce. Under the additional stress of her physical pain, Madison began to tremble even more violently, while Ian quickly hid his reaction. Madison looked up at Olivia slowly and pursed her lips. Olivia took a sharp breath. What will it take, then? How much do you want? I'll give you anything you want, all the money or property you can think of. Just name your price and it's yours. I'm not divorcing Ian. Madison refused firmly. She made no move to wipe away her tears. I'm not divorcing him no matter what happens. I'm not divorcing Ian. Ian listened to her say those words as he carefully bandaged her ankle. His face was completely expressionless. Only his lips were parted, as if to let out some of the emotions bottled up inside him. She was showing her determination not only to him but also to his mother. Is she telling the truth? Can I believe her? He asked himself. 
Her resolve shocked Olivia. The older woman wanted to say something back, but she was interrupted by Ian getting up from the bed and packing up his medical kit. She looked over at Madison without a word, and then pulled Ian out into the hallway and down the stairs to meet Dr. Hyde. The moment they left, Madison struggled hard to get out of bed, wiped away her tears, and limped out of the room. She wanted to know more about Ian's situation. Even though she had some information, she was still just waiting around to see how things developed. The Westons had all gathered anxiously by the door to the study, while the butler managed the doctors in the living room, inviting them into the house one by one. Cassandra was the first to notice Madison, as she limped over in comfortable home clothes and with untied hair, and she hurried toward her to help her out. Daniel also stood up and helped her into the chair by the door. Olivia leaned into Edward's embrace and waited quietly. Her eyes were trained on Madison, but her expression didn't betray any of her thoughts. After some time, the door finally opened, and all the Westons all stood up anxiously. Madison propped herself up too, but she couldn't see the doctor's face over all the others. A few moments later, she managed to catch a glimpse of his face as he walked out of the room. He was frowning, and there was a regretful look in his eyes. He didn't stop to give them any information and simply went to leave. She watched him walk away with a heavy heart before turning to look at the countless doctors waiting in the living room. She took a series of deep breaths to soothe herself. It's fine. It'll be fine. With so many doctors, someone will surely find a way to help him. She told herself comfortingly. She didn't know how long they waited by the door that day. All she knew was that she still hadn't left after the sun had set. Yet none of the doctors who had visited Ian had been able to provide a definite answer. The number of doctors in the living room gradually decreased, and Madison remained seated by the study, clenching and twisting her hands nervously. She felt like she might even stop breathing soon. Olivia and Edward had relocated to the living room, where they sat chatting with the doctors about Ian's illness. The atmosphere had become dull and pessimistic. When the last doctor went into the study, the sky outside was already pitch black. Madison stood up and limped over to the door, where she leaned against the wall and waited, hands clasped together as if in prayer. None of them had eaten anything that day, except for when Ian had come out during his break. But no one had said a word about being hungry. She lowered her head and waited. One. Two. Three. The seconds dragged on into minutes, and she counted each one in her mind. When the door finally opened, she was the first to see the doctor's expression. He closed the door and looked over at the Westons, shaking his head. The simple action was a horrible blow to all of them. Madison peeked through the gap in the door and saw Ian sitting up straight in his chair and with his back facing them. He showed no signs of fatigue. The moonlight shone through the window softly illuminating his form. The scene seemed so natural, as if he had been born to live in darkness. He was almost one with it. Seeing him like this, she felt like crying. I shouldn't be with the man of darkness. I should be with the man who's like sunlight, right? She thought pitifully. She didn't allow herself to cry, and instead reached up to cover her mouth with the palm of her hand as she looked at him. Daniel took the last doctor out of the house personally, while Edward and Olivia came up to the study door. They wanted to tell Ian that more doctors would be coming the next day, but it was as if something had gotten stuck in their throats, not allowing them to speak. After what seemed like ages, Ian finally moved. He got up from the chair silently and walked out. As he passed them, Madison saw the exhaustion in his deep, handsome eyes. No one could bear such pressure in one day, she thought. She wanted to comfort him, but he walked up to her and gripped her around the waist, half carrying her back up to their room. As he supported her, she gazed at him and reached out to stroke his cheek. Sleep well tonight, she told him. We'll continue tomorrow. There's still hope, isn't there? He lowered his eyes to look at her, and although he didn't give her an answer, his movements became even gentler. I've known what it would be like since the beginning, but it doesn't matter. I'm not giving up either, he thought. He was no longer afraid of what would come. 
There wasn't even a trace of worry in his mind anymore. And all because of the woman in his arms. Ian leaned back against the edge of his desk near the floor-to-ceiling windows and stared out at the gray autumn sky. The wine glass in his hand released an enticing aroma, but it didn't attract his interest at all. Madison limped in and stood behind him in silence. Looking at his stiff back, her heart ached. She clenched her fists. This makes no sense. It's been three whole days. The Westons have used all their resources to find the best doctors, and none of them could help Ian. But it's noticeable that they haven't contacted any of the biggest names in psychiatry, and that all of those names are associated with the rights in some way, she thought suspiciously. She sat on the couch and hung her head. The low hum of voices from the TV annoyed her, and she snatched up the remote control to switch it off. In her agitation, she hit the button to change the channel instead. And what she saw made her freeze. Instead of turning it off, she raised the volume. The news anchor reported that Jason Wright of A1 Logistics had started rolling out his regional operations, and he had placed his grandfather, Henry, in charge. This was causing a great deal of speculation, as Henry had never worked in the field of logistics at all. Was this nepotism? Henry had been in the city for some time, but this was the first time there had been any indication of his reasons for relocating here. When Jason had been there previously, he had been in negotiation with the Weston Business Empire for a major contract, but now they announced that it wouldn't be the Westons who received this lucrative contract. It wouldn't even be one of the companies owned by the Gold or Quinn families. No, the contract was being given to a new startup, a company no one had heard of before, called Greensy. Madison gasped as an inset picture of her father, John Greenwald, popped up in the corner of the screen. The anchor announced that having just been released from prison, his first action had been to establish a company in remembrance of his deceased daughter. Madison frowned at the footage of Jason shaking John's hand. Allie told me that the only reason that Jason recovered so quickly was that the Wrights have a private hospital where they bought or bribed all the best doctors to be on call for their benefit, she thought. The news report caught Ian's attention, and he turned his head to focus on the TV. He was just in time to catch an interview with Jason and John. Reporters were clamoring to get their attention, shouting out questions. Mr. Wright, can I ask you why you chose a small company that's just starting? Aren't you afraid that working with a small company like Greensea will limit your operations? Mr. Wright, I heard that Miss Greenwald died at one of the Wright's properties. Is that the reason that you're giving this contract to the Greenwalds? Question after question was thrown Jason's way, but he remained impassive. Raising his hand in a stop gesture, he called for silence. He made eye contact with each reporter, rejecting a serious and steady impression. But just as he was about to speak, John pushed his way in front of the microphone and addressed the crowd with a beaming smile. You've got things quite wrong, he claimed. For sure, it's unusual for a big logistics company to choose such a small partner. But it's not inconceivable. The company's new, but I'm a lifelong businessman. This has nothing to do with my daughter's tragic death. How dare you even suggest that? That sort of policy has no place in serious business. As a young man, John had risen in the business world on the back of his hard work and didn't like any insinuations to the contrary. I had enough of those snide comments about my first wife, with people claiming I was using her connections to step up. I don't want that to happen again. Just because I've been in prison for five years doesn't mean I can't get back on my feet, he thought. All his years in business and inside had helped him hone his public persona, to tell whatever story he wanted. Now, in front of the cameras, he was smiling, confident, and authoritative. It made people relax their guard. After pausing to let the reporters make notes, he continued, I'm an old hand at business. You know that. A1 Logistics and Greensy are cooperating purely for the sake of mutual benefits. It's solely a business arrangement. You're all wasting time fishing for a story that doesn't exist. 
Wouldn't you be more interested in hearing about all the employment opportunities that will come out of this deal? Let's forget about the trivialities and talk about something that matters to us all. But the reporters weren't satisfied with John's rational suggestion. They were there for gossip, and if John wouldn't give it to them, then they would try and pry it out of Jason instead. Mr. Wright, you're putting up all this capital investment in this venture, one of them asked. Can you tell me what Greensy is contributing? Mr. Wright, rumor has it that your high opinion of the eldest Greenwald daughter hasn't diminished at all. Are you working with the Greenwald family now to please her? Are you abusing your position as CEO to use the company for your personal agenda? At the sudden, dangerous turn in the questioning, Madison's hand clenched around the remote. Her eyes flicked in Ian's direction to see his response. I know he cares far too much about Jason's schemes, she thought. As she was about to switch the TV off, Ian took the remote out of her hand and sat beside her on the couch. He watched calmly. The camera was focused on Jason, who was still carefully expressionless. The reporters, getting no information out of him, were becoming more and more restless, pushing and shoving to get closer to the podium. One of them jostled John, who stumbled. Jason reached out a hand to stabilize the old man. That show of concern made all the reporters back off and take more care. Regardless of whether it was because of Kelsey or Madison, it was clear that for some reason, John Greenwald was now an important person. John thanked Jason and smiled at him kindly. With a sigh of relief, Jason faced the camera again. He didn't notice that his salacious attitude toward John had made such an impact on the gathered journalists. As a CEO, I have a responsibility to every company employee. Every decision I make is on behalf of thousands of people. I won't mess around with that and won't use my job for my betterment. The choices I make are the ones I consider the best for the entire company. You may have doubts now, but I'm certain that when you start to see the results of this partnership, all your doubts will be dispelled. This is my promise to you, Jason answered. His speech was professional and faultless. The reporter seemed to buy it, and Madison relaxed a bit. But even as she let out a sigh of relief, she watched Ian carefully to see if he was showing any sign of dissatisfaction. Will it always be like this? Whenever there's any little challenge, will I be on the edge of my seat, waiting to see if it will trigger him into an attack of paranoia? She wondered. A clamor of noise from the TV signaled the reporters throwing another barrage of questions at Jason's and John's back as they left the stage. Ian turned off the TV and tossed back all the wine in his glass. Ian? She asked hesitantly. Please respond. You haven't said a word to me since you got back from the hospital, she thought. He lifted his eyes to her, a hint of a smile on his lips. But it wasn't a happy smile. A chill ran down Madison's spine. She tried to speak, but found her words were stuck in her throat. He moved closer to her, sliding along the couch with the grace of a snake until he was looming over her. A quiver of fear rose into her heart. His arms bracketed her, trapping her against the arm of the couch. As he looked down at her with a dangerous intensity in his eyes, she shivered in a mixture of fear and arousal. Madison. He ran the empty wine glass in his hand along her cheek, and his gaze darkened. When you leave me, do you think Jason will be a good replacement? Chief Lady of the Wright family has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? She could only stare up at him with wide eyes, a rabbit caught in the headlights of his domineering gaze. It was mesmerizing. Ian locked eyes with her and threw the wine glass across the room. She jumped and caught her breath at the sharp sound. Shards of glass rained down the far wall. He smiled widely enough to show all his teeth. I don't like Jason. Even if you need to find someone else, it had better not be him. Understood? She gulped and nodded firmly. I know who my family is. Ian may have given up on us, but I never will, she thought.